Okay, I want you to tell me, well, maybe not out loud, I want you to uh, decide if any of these statements apply to you. Maybe just one of these statements. We don't have enough dinner around the dining table enough. We aren't home together enough. I'm not getting enough sleep each night. I'm not taking any time for myself. I'm reacting by yelling at my kids all of the time. I'm an Uber, dri Uber driver to my kids and nothing more. I'm, a class, I'm at class or doing assignments all day, every day. I'm working 60 to 80 hours a week. I'm bored and I have no purpose. That's the other end of the spectrum. I feel like I never have adult conversations anymore. I watch kids' shows and Disney Plus 24-7. <laughs> Dang you, Disney Plus. I mean, I feel lonely and depressed. I feel anxious to leave my house. I feel like no one sees me right now. Now, I actually relate to a quarter of those statements, not just one. And the statements I, I totally understand right now are, I'm an Uber driver, there's not enough time as a family, and we don't eat around the dining room table enough every week. Yet five years ago in that season, I related to I'm working 60 to 80 hours a week. We were opening the exchange, and so even a year and a half ago, I was like, my kids are not getting any of me. Sean's not getting any of me. I, I also was not sleeping enough, and I was not taking care of myself enough. I was not taking any time for myself. Now, how can five years, or even to be honest, two years, make a difference and be a completely different season? Because they are. And Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 3 says this, and you'll know this, there's been songs written about this. There is an appointed time for everything, and there is a time for every event under heaven, a time to give birth and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build up. So let's pray as we get into this message. God, I pray, we prayed before service, and I pray it again, God, that there are ladies in here that you've already been doing something in their heart and their life. You've been chasing them, some of them for a long while. And God, we're just on the scene at Mary and Bright to show up at the point that you've already gotten them to. God, you're already doing something, speaking to them, stirring up things, allowing doubts and confusion. We're just showing up on the scene and we're gonna play whatever part you'd have us play. So tonight, I pray this message will speak individually to hundreds of women so that they each get their own message from this. In Jesus' name, amen. So the season I'm obviously talking about, I'm in right now, is a desire to grasp as much family time as I can. We have a freshman and a sophomore, so it's literally like sand through the hourglass. And so I, I know that we have Sunday Shabbat. That's our dinner around the table at night. We went to Israel. It really sealed the deal. And we were gonna, I, we were gonna do that. We'd been doing it. Sunday nights, we have our family dinner. But I'm fighting for Tuesday night. So I put it in my calendar. I invited Sean. I invited Aubrey. I invited Isaiah. Because sometimes, more than verbally, it's important to invite them on Google Calendar. And so I invited them. But can I just be honest? We're batting two for four right now. No, I lie, one for four. In the last month, we've, even though it's on the calendar, we've made it one night. Because this practice is a makeup class. This one, lifting went longer. There's a volleyball game, can I please stay? And suddenly, my Tuesday nights have amounted to one. However, we did put up Christmas tree decorations and all of that one Tuesday night in November, and the kids stuck with us for two of the four hours it took. And that is a win. That used to not be a win. It used to be a win when they were wanting to be under my feet and help with decorations all Saturday and then watch Elf with me. And now I say, can we watch Elf, my favorite movie of all time? And they, they just, they know, they just go, no. And it's like not even like I, I want to make them, I want to ground them, unless they watch Elf, we're in a different season. So what I've learned is I have to be flexible. And ladies, you have to be flexible in the seasons that you're in. But we have this albatross as moms, as wives, as sisters, as daughters, that's saying, I just need to balance it all. And so tonight's message is called Debunking Balance. I'm going to be writing a book upcoming, and one of the chapters is going to be called Flex. And the reason I'm going to call it flex is because flex and being flexible will make you and your whole family 
calmer. And what I mean by flex is this. So our team has been getting for, ready for Mary and Bright. So often, because they're working all day on Friday, that's usually a day off. It, they got to get ready tomorrow for Saturday or late to, or for Sunday. So late tonight, they're still working. We do what's called the flex schedule at work. I know that our pastors can tell their people, just come to work Monday late, or just don't come in Monday because you worked over the weekend. So if we'll do that at work, why won't we do that in our families? We think we have to be rigid and we're gonna have family traditions if it means we hate each other. Like we're gonna have family traditions. And so, but here's the misconception because we look on Instagram and we say, well, they have it all and balance it all and do it all. In fact, I had a 30 year old ask me on a recent Jesus Plus Life podcast and video episode. She said, how do you do it all? <laughs> and I laughed and thought, you're so stupid. I don't, <laughs> I don't do it all. I don't do it all. I've, I've never done it all. I'm just appearing like I'm doing it all now because I did one thing at a time, one season at a time. This is how. Now, I didn't laugh in her face and tell her she was stupid. We were on air, and it was going to air on Facebook and YouTube. And, you know, know, let me tell you. So this is what I said to her. I said, I do one thing at a time. When we opened the exchange, that's what I did. We elevated some people on staff here so I could go and focus at the exchange. And then I never came back and put them back down a level and became their boss in that area. They took it and went. Forced delegation is always amazing. I say no to a lot. A lot. I said no to a friend of mine who wanted me to come visit her, and she, I mean, we broke up over it. She couldn't fathom I wouldn't come to see her. She said, it's not that you don't have the money. I said, but I don't want to because I, have, I, don't, I can't bring my kids, and I don't want to be away from my kids, and I'm focused on the exchange and the church, and I don't want to. She just couldn't believe it. But I said, no, I might make some people mad, but you know what, she's not family. So that was a season of friendship that's not a season now. Third, I said, I get one thing mastered, managed, or developed, and then next, I take it off my plate before I go on to the next. So when we think people are juggling and balancing, it's actually a lie. I have never done more than one thing at a time, really, really well when it comes to my work. But we think we have to live on a tightrope. I have a picture of a girl who <laughs> looks like she could actually uh, be on a tightrope. Uh, cute body, hater, and so um, <laughs> there's her. And then, uh, did you guys see that movie where the guy t tight ropes from one skyscraper to another? It was a real story. And I mean, I was, I was watching the movie going, I love true stories, but this is the stupidest human being I've ever met because he refused, he didn't want like anything to catch him. He just wanted to free fall in the city and then tight rope. So if it doesn't work to tight rope, like, that makes no sense to us. Why do we think we live on a tightrope? So, we're going to talk about balance tonight. We're debunking balance. But I think it's important we look at what the Bible says. So, theologically, what's the Bible say about balance? Because we're on a quest to conquer and to have balance in our busy world. We are. We're just on a quest. If we could read a book, we probably have read a book. How to have balance. Balancing your life, balancing your priorities. Let me tell you that in the Bible, there is not one place that the concept of balance as we know it is written about in the Bible. Just like I just, this is a free, this is, I mean, all of it's free, <laughs> but this is extra. Okay, I just realized there's something else not in the Bible that I thought was in the Bible. It's funny when you read the Bible and you dig in, you learn things. And so I learned that there is no such thing as tough love theologically. Did you know that? I thought that that's good advice you give parents, especially when their kids are on drugs and their kids want to come get money and their kids are strung out, and you just tell a parent, just tough love. So I looked up, where does tough love come from? And I thought, for sure it's a parenting book. Nope. It came from uh, Dr. James Dobson on marriage. It has nothing to do with parenting. So then I looked in the Bible and went, okay, well, what's the Bible say about tough love? Nothing. In fact, Jesus says, take the tough out of your, your sentence right now, just love, just love. And you know, when I wanna discipline my kids, I wanna love them, but I also want, you know, like, give me advice. Yes, I'll love my kids, but what else? And God's just like, just love, just love, because the Bible doesn't say there's anything as, such as tough love. The same thing goes for balance. The Bible doesn't say anything about balance, all of these things, ladies, and juggle a bunch of plates. What it does say in Leviticus and Isaiah is that it gives us a Hebrew word 
which is beam. So I went and I found this in the back loading dock. And I'm gonna try not to, good thing nobody's on stage, I'd take them out. Um, and so I found this. And I thought, no, I'm not going to walk on a wire. But I did think this would express what I'm talking about. So balance, according to scripture, has two basic ideas. The first one is think of it like a teeter-totter, which can we just take a moment of silence for all of us that never went up on the teeter-totter? <laughs> I never went up. I just sat there. And, and I never went up. And my daughter is not a big girl. And she looked at me, I was preaching this to her, she made mac and cheese last night, and I think she was pretending to listen. And I said, baby, did, she goes, I never went up. I always sat on the other end, because all of her friends were the string beans. So how, I don't even want to know. I was going to say, how many went up? Let's not even, we don't, we don't even want to know. So think of this like balance, according to the Bible, is more like a teeter-totter. Think of like Egyptian weights or scales, you know, you see it on government buildings when they used to put scales and weights and you had to equal it out and liberty, you know, and justice for all is like there's equal weights. Very similar to what the Bible's talking about. What, it, what the Bible is talking about is equal weight or being worthy. So let's look at it this way. If it's tilted this way, that means that we are someone that has a lot of knowledge we know a lot of truth, but we don't act on it. We have a lot of knowledge in our head. We know what to do. We know what's right, but we never really act on it. In fact, that is called walking unworthily. That's this side is down. This would be faith without works is dead. This is that you're not putting work to your belief. But lean it this way, and it's equally true that to say that Christianity or living a good life is all you need, and you don't adjust what you believe, you don't take the Bible, and you say, is there a true north? You just live a good life. That's on this side. So what this is saying is that biblically worthiness is knowing the truth and acting on it. It's equal. This, th this is what I know. My ideas and plans must submit to God. That's what gets this level and balanced. It has nothing to do with how many plates I'm juggling and do I do spend enough time with my kids and husband. It is, do I know the truth and do I walk it out? That's the first part of what balance means biblically. The second thing is like step two. So if you know that and you do that, now what is the next step biblically? It's called becoming. This is where our beliefs and our actions never clash. Becoming like Jesus is what we're trying to do at Life Church. We're trying to actually believe him and then act like him. But this becoming word that's in the Bible for balance actually is like, do your clothes match your accessories? That's basically it's saying, this is level when what you say is what you do. And can I tell you, I have not practiced what I've preached recently to my kids. Full confession, this would be this imbalance in action. I will tell people at church... Here, I will tell people we were just at a conference in Toronto. I will tell them that I had a baby at 15 years old. She died. God helped me. God got me through. God has done something with my life. It's not too late for all of you. To my kids, I say, you go to a school dance, you're going to get pregnant. You're pregnant. Your life is over. There's no hope. Totally different. <laughs> now, I thought that was good parenting, but it's not. That's that my clothes and my accessories don't match. What I'm saying, I don't actually practice when it comes to my own children. That's what balance is. So I had that major revelation, but I also had this major revelation. God said to me the other day, he said, you aren't asked to live on a tight rope where you straddle the impossible goal of balancing on a wire perfectly upright your whole life. And that's what women in this room are trying to do. And every time you wobble, you feel like you've let everybody down, and we feel like we have. We feel the pressure of the wobble. But like God said this to me, life isn't a straight line from start to finish. It's not linear, it's actually vertical. And so we're gonna talk tonight about how it is vertical. So I wanna show you what balance really is. Let's look at this screen that's a triangle, and I have God on the bottom. And the reason I have him on the bottom is because if we start with him, isn't that, a lot stronger of a base versus the wobbling on a wire. 
In fact, Matthew 6.33 says, but seek first the kingdom of God, that base, and his righteousness and all the things in your day and all the things in your life will be added to you. The base doesn't shift or tilt, it's stable. It's not like walking on wire. This is what it looks like when we try to walk on a wire. Pull that up. It's, it's not me, I'm not gonna claim that over myself. There it is. This, this is more like when we try to do it on our own. I don't feel or look like that girl. I may not look like an elephant, but I, I can't believe, I mean, this isn't probably a real picture, but it was like they were trying to do the impossible in circuses if this, ever, this kind of thing ever happened. But this is what it feels like when we try to do worthiness and we try to become in our own strength. But, the, back to the practical, the triangle starts with God. The second level up from the strong foundation that is not on a wire but is strong and firm is myself. You have got to be the next most important in your life. And I preached this message last year and I preach it every time I get a chance. That we have to have our first five in order. Now I'm not gonna go through the first five or our fave five. It's in my book, Jesus Plus Life. It's in the guy's edition, Jesus Plus Life. But this is one of the quotes from Jesus Plus Life. If you aren't good, you're not good for anyone. So if we put God at the bottom of our base of our triangle, and some of us haven't even done that, but then we put our spouse and our kids in the next level, and then we're somewhere along the way if we fit it in, we're not good, so we're actually not good for them and we've got everything out of order. It actually should go like the third triangle I'm gonna show you, which is God is the foundation, me next, and then everybody else. So the practical big an answer, the big answer for how you have balance is this, you don't steal from the same bucket two weeks in a row. I gave you the biblical way of looking at balance. I'm gonna give you the practical day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month of balance because we have to debunk we're gonna have balance in one day. If we have these buckets, and I'm gonna show you all of the buckets, if we have all of these buckets and we are pulling from the kids' bucket, stealing from that, robbing from that, we didn't get kid time this week, just don't, rob from it next week. If you didn't have husband time this week, then don't rob from it next week. And for sure not, a month from now, you're still robbing from the same bucket. Doesn't that give you like a release of some pressure? Because what we think is that every single day, we've got to balance all those buckets. And I'm sure you have more than those buckets represented on your list of what goes on in your life. So the big practical answer is do not rob. Here's an example. If I haven't eaten right this week, fix it next. But instead, we didn't eat right today, so we threw up our hands and we give up altogether. But listen, there's some grace in, you've got this week or next week. I mean, it is Thanksgiving. Frankly, I think that December, um, you know, that's, that's just kind of a wash. But here's the thing, if I can eat Thanksgiving, and literally we went to bed at seven o'clock that night because the turkey had paralyzed us. Like, physic we were a little, like, we were bad on Thanksgiving night. The next week, actually no, we went to Toronto and we ate really bad, so never mind. It's week two, robbed. This week I did good. This week I went to dirt and got a juice. I mean, that redeems everything, right? Like you go get something juiced, you put it in some wheatgrass. Okay, so if you haven't eaten right this week, then fix it next. Another example, if I haven't spent time with Sean this week, fix it next week. If I didn't get time with my kids and we couldn't have like real good talk, Fix it next. We're always gonna live between the tension of balance. In fact, if you don't think we're gonna li live and it's normal to live in the tension of balance, listen to 2 Corinthians 6.10. It says, we're sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. What? We're poor, yet making many rich, huh? Having nothing and yet possessing everything, what? Like, like that, that's a paradox. That it makes no sense, but that's why we need Jesus because the Bible talks about, and Ecclesiastes talked about it, we trade mourning for dancing, but sometimes we're mourning and dancing in the same day, in the same week, and the same month, and we can't think we're losing our mind. We may just be in a different season, but we are trying to compare ourselves to people in other season, seasons, and we're thinking they have all of the balance. We can't compare ourselves. You can't say you want her life for your life. Her balanced life is probably struggling with a quarter of the problems 
that I listed at the beginning. Do not try to insert yourself into someone else's season. Comparison is the great crippler, it just is. When we go into comparison, we start to see everybody else and think they're balanced, and we think we're not. I have a lady who I have gone to her yoga class in De Pere. Well, I'm gonna say her name, I don't think she's here, but you would totally say, oh, I know her and love her if you've been there. Allie, love her, her. Padretti Yoga. She's amazing, and she has joy all over. I mean, literal signs that say joy all over the place, which I love that. I love when people will focus in and zero in on joy rather than happiness, because happiness is happenstance. It's what happens to you, so if something bad happens, you're not gonna be happy, you're gonna be the opposite. But joy is that innate thing, but joy you only get from Jesus. And Allie, Allie doesn't come to this church. Allie, I think, may be loosely Catholic, let's say that. I think she said she's gone to a Catholic church here and there because she did talk to me about it a little bit, a little bit, because she knows we own the exchange. And Allie said this, and I thought, woman, you are preaching and you don't even know it. She said, if we could put everyone's problems in the center of this room, which she was talking a yoga room, but let's just consider on this stage, if each one of you could put all of your problems in the center of this stage right now, but you needed to pick one back up, we'd probably take our own back. And I thought, man, because when we do hear the depravity, like you think, and you're going, no, you don't know how bad it is. I mean, there are people that they've told me stories and had me pray for them that I was shocked and I feel like I've heard everything. I loved that, that here's the thing, you have to find success for your life in your rhythm, in your season. But the problem is we want to do it like an impossible diet. Like I said, instead of saying, I, I robbed from this bucket this week, I won't next week, what we do is we try to do it like a diet, an impossible diet, and so we give up on our marriage when it's not going good in this season. We give up on our teenagers and we go, just let them come home when they want. I'm sick of fighting with them. We give up on staying calm around our toddler. We start to tell ourselves, I'm just a yeller. I'm, I just yell. Rather than going, I messed up this week, so balance would be next week, Sonny's going to yell less. We give up on working where we work. Because if we could just focus on us in the season we're in and we do better next, it will help. So here's the answer as well. Lower your expectations of so-called balance, because it's not even biblical, and expect God to give you discernment for each season. Success isn't being a perfect mom, it's being a kinder mom. And it's a being a kinder mom this month than last month. Not perfect next month, but better than you were the month before. Success isn't being a perfect boss. It's me being a more attentive boss this month than I was last. So that in a year from now, if my gauge is every month, I get a little better, I yell a little less. In 12 months, it's going to be a lot better. I heard somebody said, I think it was Pastor Lori on staff here. She said, you don't lose 10 pounds at a time, you lose one pound at a time to get to 10 pounds of losing. And I went, oh, mind blown. But we try to get to this balance and then we give up. Here's another thing, success isn't being a perfect Jesus person, it's being more in love with Jesus this month than last and leaning into Jesus in each new season. I'm gonna read to you the lyrics from a song that is killing me right now because this is the season I'm in. A child arrived just the other day. He came to the world in the usual way, but there were planes to catch and bills to pay. He learned to walk while I was away, and he was talking before I knew it, and as he grew, he said, I'm gonna be like you, Dad. You know I'm gonna be like you. And the cat's in the cradle when you come, in, and then I'm, I'm skipping all the verses, or the choruses. When you come in home, Dad, I don't know when, but we'll get together then. You know we'll have a good time then. So my son turned 10 just the other day. He said, thanks for the ball, Dad. Come on, let's play. Can you teach me to throw? I said, not today. I got a lot to do. He said, it's okay. And he walked away, but his smile never dimmed. And he said, I'm going to be like him. Yeah, you know I'm going to be like him. And the cat's in the cradle and the silver spoon. When you come home, Dad, I don't know when, but we'll get together then. You know we'll have a good time then. He came from college just the other day. Such, so much like a man, I just had to say, son, I'm proud of you. Can you sit for a while? He shook his head and said with a smile, what I'd really like, Dad, is to borrow the car keys. See you later. Can I have them, please? And the cat's in the cradle. 
When are you coming home, son? I don't know when, but we'll get together then, dad. You know, we'll get, have a good time then. Now I'm retired. My son's moved away. I called him up just the other day. I said, I'd like to see you if you don't mind. He said, I'd love to, dad, if I could find the time. My new job's a hassle and the kids got the flu, but it's nice talking to you, dad. It's sure nice talking to you. As I hung up the phone, it occurred to me, he's grown up to be just like me. My boy was just like me and the cat's in the cradle. When you come in home, son, I don't know when, but we'll get together then, Dad. You know we'll have a good time then. Mother Teresa said, if you want to bring happiness to the whole world, go home and love your family. So you know the season I'm in right now? That I've got very few years left with my teenagers. So that song needs to ring in my ears. That's not guilt. That's not shame. That is recognition that that's the season I'm in. I want you to take a few minutes and you'll have time, we're gonna have a last song tonight, and you'll have time to definitely think about what success would look like in your life just in this season. Because we don't need to look for balance, we need to look for what is success this week or this month compared to last week and last month. I'm gonna share with you my three things that success in this season, because you know what, we gotta flex. It'll change, and my next season will be empty nest, and then I will have to look at it and go, how do I balance, biblically, actions and truth in my life, but how do I have, in this season, what God would see as success, and that's gonna change in the next season. So here's for now mine, after you heard that song that really hit me. Here's success, having one to two nights a week of focused time with our teens. We watched half of Frozen last night, and I just shut it off because I literally hate the morning, and I just needed to go to bed. But Aubrey and I got to lay there and watch half of Frozen in preparation to watch Frozen 2. Uh, then number two, reacting in love. Man, that's tough. I want to have tough love. I want to hear what they did, or they're, they're in shopping carts in Target, and out in the parking lot, in shopping carts, pushing each other, could get hit by a car, could die. She tells me that, or Isaiah tells me, whoever did it. I want to be tough because there needs to be a lecture and discipline and that could have killed you. Well, we had that conversation, but there are things that they come and tell me that they don't need a lecture, they already know. I just need to love them. There may be consequences, but I need to love and not lecture because I'm a great lecturer. Also, success for me looks like leaning into Jesus at least three times per week with extended time. Notice I didn't say seven times a week. Three times a week. Now, I can get more than three times a week in, but extended time with Jesus. And here's the best part. When my kids can catch me having Jesus time, that's when the cat's in the cradle, and I would hope that they'd want to be like me someday. So the overflow, though, from that success would be that Number one, the kids want to spend time and maybe be with us more than two nights a week. Maybe the kids come to us with juicier topics than they already are, and they're willing to share it because they know they're going to get us to listen, not just jump into lecture. And that God uses me beyond my wildest hopes and dreams because my goal is to lean into him. That's success for me, to be famous in my own home. My daughter told a TV show, not a TV show, a filming we were doing. And they said, who is your mom? What is your mom really like? You can be honest. It's just you and the camera and my mom <laughs> and her mom sitting there. So uh, she said, you know, Elf, that's my mom. Now, I, now you might go, oh, really? <laughs> like green tights and curly hair and <laughs> he was gross. Uh, no, like I... I couldn't have thought of a better compliment because you know what? I, I could totally be goofy once a week on stage or once in a while when I feel it, as Season would say, when I feel it in my gizzard. <laughs> when I feel it deep down, the joy in my gizzard. Yes, we were raised on a ranch and we killed chickens and they had gizzards. I can do that once in a while when I feel it. But you know what? That my daughter would say, I'm elf. And she said, and she's always elf. And I was just like, that means so much to me that she doesn't say she's a mean woman, and then she puts on a front. Don't know why I'm crying. Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 4, but in the ESV, listen to this for you. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh. 
Sometimes right in the same time. A time to mourn and a time to dance. So what season are you in right now? And what would success look like in this season for you? Just this season. Will you bow your heads all across the place and close your eyes? I just, I don't have to have God tell me that there's people who are struggling in this season. I know that we're human, so that's a big possibility, a great possibility, that in this season you're struggling, but maybe tonight you needed to hear that the seasons pass, the seasons change, and you needed to have lift off your shoulders this albatross of you gotta balance it all. No, you don't. You have some focuses for this season. Maybe you're not supposed to start a business right now, even though that's a great idea. Maybe you're not supposed to go save the world right now, although that's a great idea. Maybe you're not supposed to get a divorce because it's never a great idea. Maybe you're in a season and all you need to do is get through this season and find success for this season, not for five, 10, and 20 years from now. So before we can start that, we have to start the season of life with Jesus in the center, him at the bottom of the triangle, the foundation that doesn't shift, that doesn't move when our seasons move. And so I'm not gonna ask anybody to raise their hand, or I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand, I'm not gonna ask you to come up to the front to walk an aisle, I'm not gonna center you out or point you out at all. In fact, I'm just gonna ask you to make eye contact with me and or raise your hand, because some of you came with four other ladies and you're like, okay, I know they do this Jesus thing, but I don't. And so if you just wanna, nobody's gonna see it. If you just wanna look me in the eyeball, I can see most eyes in here. Or if you wanna slip up your hand slightly and you say, I need to add Jesus to every season, to my entire life. And I wanna start that journey tonight. I'm gonna ask that you just slip up your hand and put it right back down. I'm gonna start right over here. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, 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 thank you. I'm just getting to the center now, so if I didn't, if you already slipped it up, I'm just on the center now. I'm looking over to your right, my left. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Then far, thank you, thank you. Man. Best decision you'll make, even over marriage or having a baby, I'm telling you, it really is, because it's where everything is the foundation starter. So if everyone in the room, then nobody knows who raised their hand, I would love if you would fill out the card at the end, we'll talk about that, but otherwise nobody has to know, or all your friends can know. It's something to be super proud of. So if everyone in the room would just say this, repeat this prayer after me, along with everyone else. Say, dear Jesus, I need you. I need you as my foundation. I repent, I do ask forgiveness, and I wanna start the new journey with you. In Jesus' name, amen. It is really that simple, although it's not easy. This is the start of the Jesus journey. We wanna help you. I wanna specifically, I wanna personally help you. So if you will take that card I talked about earlier and you'll just check the box on that card that says, it's a yellow highlighted, it says, I'm choosing to follow Jesus. You can slip it in the black buckets at the end. You could take it to the Welcome Center if you want. We want to actually put in your hand a little packet that we have for you. So even if you put it in the black bucket, will you find an usher as you leave or go to the Welcome Center and get the little packet? It has a 12-minute CD you can slip in your car and you can listen to what are the next steps on your Jesus journey. But before we're done tonight, and then there's, there's a couple more things. There's some great surprises here at the end. Maybe you're here and you say, I already had Jesus, but I need prayer. So just bow your heads, close your eyes one more time. If you would say, you know what, my truth and my action is not matching. I don't really wanna put myself out there, but I need my truth, like not my truth, Jesus' truth. I need the truth of the Bible, what I know to be right, and my actions to start matching. I need to release the pressure of balance, maybe. Maybe that's your prayer, that you need to let yourself off the hook, and you need to not walk out of here and take all of those plates and put them back on your shoulders, but you actually need to release yourself from the whole worldly 
the whole worldly concept of balance and only take on the biblical balance. If that's you and you say, Sonny, I just need prayer because I need to walk out of here new and released and free. Will you slip up your hand again? Thank you all over the place, all over, gosh, all over the place. Let me pray for you. Lord Jesus, I thank you for ladies who would listen to my crazy, who would come and be a part of such a special event. But God, what I think is the best is that these moments was really the whole point. The whole point of the boutique and the Christmas shopping and the music and the lights and the food. This is really what's important because God, what we wanna do is take from this building something that will forever change us, something that will be the start of something new. So for freedom that women are feeling, I pray they wouldn't walk out these doors and put it right back on their shoulders, God. I pray that they would chew on and saturate on these words. It would forever change them. In Jesus' name, amen.